says woe to you it's something that we need to pay attention to because whenever a prophet um, or anywhere in the word of God whenever it says woe to you it's saying that God's judgment and punishment is upon you it's saying that you you have a curse upon you and it's a very serious thing and I know that it's a very popular thing nowadays to ignore um, the quote negative parts of the Bible but you guys have to understand that if you don't have the whole counsel of God if you don't have the entire word of God then you are going to fall into deception and you know what the result of deception is hell because if you fall into deception you're going to think you're okay you're going to think that God's judgment toward you is going to be favorable on judgment day when it may not be so it's really really important for us to look at those places not just the places that say blessed are you not just the places that um, where God um, gives promises to his covenant people you know we love to to reach in and grab those promises and name them and claim them and make them our own and say I am the head and not the tail and I will lend and not borrow and all of these things and that's fine and good if you're in covenant with God. However, it's very, very important that we do not always assume that we're the good guy in the equation. You see, you guys, we, we tend to, as human beings, we, we tend to cast ourselves as the hero or the heroine in our own story. And when we um, think of ourselves as being written into God's story, um, we kind of assume that we're the good guy. You know, we always look at, at ourselves through rose-colored glasses, don't we? And so we assume that, you know, those blessings are for us. Sometimes we, we say, okay, yeah, I'm loved by God. I'm, I'm blessed by God. And, and that's, that's true if you're in a covenant with God. But, you know, if you ignore the places where God gives warnings to people, if you ignore the places where he tells people that, that his judgment is upon them, then you're ignoring the opportunity that you have to let the word of God shine its light on your heart and show you the places that, if they remain until Judgment Day, will be judged on Judgment Day. See, we want to let the Word of God judge our hearts now so that we can repent, so that we can come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. I'm, I'm turning my back on that sin by your power. I'm walking away from it. But, you guys, if we always see ourselves through rose-colored glasses and we always assume that all the blessings are for us and all the curses are for somebody else, not us, then you know what can happen to us. We can end up like one of those people that Jesus said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. For many will say to me on that day, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and do many miracles? And Jesus will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. And you guys, you understand that these people are just like us as Christians, you know? They're walking along, they're thinking they're just fine with God. They're thinking God has no problem with them and they are going to heaven. Now, can you imagine you, personally, walking along thinking you're going to heaven, getting to judgment day, and only then, when it's too late, finding out that God's judgment is upon you and it is not a favorable judgment and you are going to hell. This is what we want to avoid, you guys. So let us look at the places where God says, woe to you. Let us look at the places where God tells us who he has cursed or who he calls cursed or who he has judged guilty. Let us look at those places and let us measure our own hearts by that. Let us look at look at our own hearts in the light of that scripture and say, okay, do I have that kind of evil in my heart so that we can repent of it and be free of it? So this scripture, it says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Okay, you see, God is the definer of all things. And um, what we're going to talk about today is the fact that we have got to allow God to be the authority in our lives if we want to be a part of his kingdom. See, that means that he is the king. That's why it says thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Not mine is the kingdom. Because, see, God is the one who defines everything. He's the king. He's the one who tells us what is evil and what is good. 
He's the one who tells us what is blessed and what is cursed. And you see, we've got a choice. When, when God's judgments as to what is good and what is evil and what is blessed and what is cursed, when those things don't line up with our own intellect, we've got a choice. As Christians, we've got a choice. I'm not talking about atheists or whatever. I'm talking about as Christians. When it offends our intellect or our pride, when it takes the things that we value and throws them in the garbage and takes the things that we don't value and exalts them to a high place and we don't understand it and we don't like it and our flesh doesn't like it, we've got a choice. We can say, yes, God, if you said it is good, if you said it is blessed, I agree with you, it is blessed. We can allow him to have that authority in our lives. Because he is the final word, you guys. He is the authority, whether you like it or not. The only question is, how are you going to react to that authority? Are you going to accept it or reject it? So we can accept that when it goes against our flesh. Or we can look at our own opinions and our own judgments. And we can try to twist the word of God. And ignore parts of the word of God. And do whatever we can to manipulate the word of God to try to mask it and put a smoke screen around it and pretend that it says what we think. That what God has called evil is actually good because we think it's good, you know, and we find ways to do that, you guys. And if you think that you don't, you have to understand that the Bible says that our heart, it is sick. It says that it is deceitful and sick beyond understanding. You can't trust your own heart. If you think you're too good to be deceived, you guys, Jesus warned his own disciples about being deceived. He said, be on your guard. Don't think you're too good. Don't think you're, you have too much faith. Don't think that you're too righteous, that your heart is too good to ever be able to be deceived. Because your heart is always, always trying to trick you into thinking that God wants what your flesh wants. Wouldn't that be convenient? <laughs> Don't listen to it, okay, you guys? The only way that we can see clearly is not to trust our own heart, but to look at the Word of God and the judgments of God and what He calls good and what He calls evil. Now, you guys, this says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, okay? We have got to agree with God's definitions. And we see the same thing in the promise that God made to Abraham. In Genesis 12, 2 through 3, He says, I will make you into a great nation. He's talking to Abraham. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, this is one of those scriptures that we like to, um, to cast ourselves in the, in, in the um, role of Abraham and say, yeah, whoever blesses me is blessed and whoever curses me is cursed and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's fine if you're in a covenant relationship with God. That's true. But you also need to look at the warning here because the other side of it, the curse can belong to you, too, if you don't apply the scripture to your life. Because what God is saying is, you know what, whatever, whoever, specifically whoever I have called blessed. If you call them blessed, I will bless you. If you call them cursed, I will curse you. See, we've got to look at the warning, too, if we don't want to end up like one of those people who think they're going to heaven and then they end up in hell, right? We want to know. We want to know what God expects out of us. And so it's a very important thing to find out what God defines as blessed and specifically who God defines as blessed, okay? Okay? And then we need to agree with God. And if we find that we have been in disagreement with God on those things, then we need to repent. So now we're going to bring it forward. Present day, okay? We're in the end times. Jesus warned us that there would be many false prophets that would come and deceive many people. And we're there, guys. And now the false prophets and the false teachers, they've got names and they've got faces. And they've always been around. But, but this deception is even greater now that, that, that the, the time is drawing to an end. And, and Jesus said many, many people will be deceived. Satan so will come to, to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. So he makes that a little mystery for us to keep us on edge, <laughs> to keep us humble, to say, okay, you know, even I could be deceived. We've got to be on our guard. So here we are. And you guys, we've got a lot of teaching out there as to what is blessing, what is prosperity, what is cursed. And there are a lot of theories and conclusions and assumptions that people make about the Bible. But remember, we don't have the right to express the gospel of God in mere words of human wisdom. Paul said, I came to you not, not to baptize 
but to preach the gospel, and that not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Because, you see, you guys, the only reason that a teacher needs to come to you with their own words to explain the Bible is because their conclusions aren't in the Bible. So they've got to express it to you in their own words. And that's why you've got to get their book or their tape or their DVD in order to get a revelation on the teaching of God, according to them. Because you're not going to find those conclusions in the Bible. They came to them by, by, a, by a vision or, or by some deep insight from God. And their unspiritual minds puff them up with pride because of what they think they've seen. But you guys, if God meant to say it, he said it. And what he says, he means. And we've got some decisions to make, you guys. We've got some decisions to make as to who has the authority. Who has the final word in our life? So let's go and let's find out. Who did Jesus define as his blessed people? Who did Jesus define as blessed? And who did Jesus identify as cursed? Now I'm going to read this passage to you out of Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. And the situation here is that um, it says that Jesus um, was there with a large crowd of his disciples and also a, a large number of people from Judea were around him. So there were a lot of people around. And it says in verse 20, it says, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you. Hear that phrase? Woe to you who are rich. For you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Now you guys, I'm going to really challenge you. Jesus said, he identified that the people that he blessed are the poor people. Do you believe that? Does your favorite Bible teacher teach that? Have you ever been taught that if you are poor, you are blessed of God? Or have you been taught that poverty is a curse? Did you hear what I just said? What did God say to those who curse those that he has blessed? Because he just said the poor people are blessed. And if you say they're cursed, poverty is a curse, guess what he's going to do to you? According to that scripture in Genesis 12, 2 through 3, he's going to curse you. Just like Israel. Just like Abraham, I mean. Whoever called Abraham blessed, God would bless him. Whoever called Abraham cursed, God would curse him. Why? Because God blessed him. And whoever calls what is evil good and what is good evil, they're cursed. If you don't agree with God's judgment as to who is blessed, then you are cursed. Some of you have even been taught this lie. Some of you have been taught in order to justify this false doctrine that it is God's will for you to be wealthy on this earth, even though Jesus said it's really hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So people are teaching you that God wants to do something in your life that's going to make it really hard for you to get into the kingdom of heaven. Now you think about that. But you have even been taught, some of you have even been taught, and some of you are teaching this lie to justify your idea that God's disciples are supposed to be wealthy. This lie that says, Jesus was a rich man. Hey, what do you know? Jesus' disciples were rich. <laughs> After all, they couldn't do the kind of ministry they were doing without money. Really? Well, Jesus fed 5,000 people without money. That was kind of the whole point. You know, he didn't need the riches of the world in order to accomplish God's will. That's why he didn't bow at Satan's feet when Satan offered it to him on a platter. 
in the desert? He said no. Because he didn't have to do it Satan's way. See, God doesn't need the money to get his job done. And in fact, when there's a lot of money involved, nobody can see the glory of God. Because they think it's the money that did it. Or they think it's the good person with all the money that did it. They can't see God's glory through the filthy lucre, guys. He loves to do things without money. He loves to show that he can provide for us miraculously. You see that all throughout scripture. Elijah was fed by ravens, okay? (laughs) That's miraculous. But it is not a luxurious lifestyle. And the life of a prophet, you guys, it is hard. It is not going to be easy. I'm not saying you'll never go through a season of having money, but you know what? The life of a disciple is hard. It's uncomfortable. And if you want to say that Jesus was rich, then you're saying that Jesus is a liar. You found a way to twist scripture around and try to make it say something it doesn't say. You found a way to try to pretend that Jesus did not mean it when he said, you know, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. Oh, well, that doesn't mean he was homeless. Well, yeah, it does. How would you feel if you didn't have a place to lay your head? Is that a life of luxury? He didn't have a hundred houses. It didn't say that he had a hundred houses. It didn't even say he had one house. It did say he didn't have a place. He said he didn't have a place to lay his head. Now, was he lying? Was he speaking figuratively? Oh, so now we're just going to pick the places that we don't like in Scripture and pretend that they're figurative and they don't mean anything. And in fact, that they even mean the opposite of what they say. Isn't that convenient for our flesh, which wants to be rich? You guys are going to have to learn to rebel against your flesh if you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Because you're not going to make it in with your flesh. You've got to be circumcised. Your heart's got to be circumcised. That means your flesh has got to be cut off of you. And you know what? If it doesn't hurt, it's not working. If your doctrine and what you believe about the Bible, if it doesn't hurt your flesh, it's not working. Because you know what Jesus said? You have got to die in order to live. You've got to lay down your life. If you want to keep your life, you have to lose it. You have to die every day. And not just any kind of death, you guys. Death by cross. That is a painful death. So you've got to be done with your sin. But we justify what we want by saying, oh, it's what God wants too. <clears throat> and we ignore what God has called blessed. And we even get to the place where we can lie about it and say, hey, Jesus' disciples are rich. It's his will that I'm rich too. When Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor. And you guys, he didn't just say that to anybody. He didn't just say that to everybody. He looked, it says this, looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor. Now, you know what? You can go to Bible college. You can get a doctorate in theology. You can study Greek and Hebrew, and you can huff and you can puff, but you can't blow this house down. You cannot erase the words of Jesus, and you can't change them. And all you're going to do by trying to redefine God's blessings and God's curses by disagreeing with them, all you're going to do is bring down a judgment on yourself. Woe to you. Who call what is evil good and what is good evil? If you curse those that God has blessed, he's going to curse you. Now, some of you have gone even farther. Some of you have been teaching that those that are blessed of God, that Jesus identified as blessed of God, blessed are the poor. You've gone as far as to claim that they have an evil spirit. It's called the spirit of poverty. Now you guys are on dangerous, dangerous ground, and I'm going to warn you right now, you guys are just like about that close to hell. And this is why I'm saying that to you. Because we see a place in Scripture where the Pharisees looked at what Jesus was doing, and they claimed that he was doing it by the power of Beelzebub. They claimed he was doing it by the power of Satan. He was casting out demons by the power of demons. And after they did that, Jesus went on and told them, you know what? (laughs) If you speak against me, the Son of Man, that'll be forgiven of you. But if you speak against the Holy Spirit, it's called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, 
that will not be forgiven of you in this age or in the age to come. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. But, you guys, if you just look at what the Pharisees were doing, they were looking at someone who was blessed of God, Jesus, and they weren't only calling him evil, but they were looking at him and saying that the spirit inside of him, which was the spirit of God, was an evil spirit. Now, do you really want to walk that close to the line? Do you want to do the same thing that they did? Do you want to look at those that God has identified as blessed of God, that he has given his spirit to? You want to look at them and say, you've got an evil spirit? Woe to you. You better be careful. In fact, if you've done that, and if God's convicting you right now, I would, I would encourage you right now to pause this video and get down on your knees and repent because you are so close to hell. You're so close to damnation. You're so close to committing the same kind of sin that the Pharisees were, were committing when Jesus, when Jesus identified that as, as blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Be careful, you guys. You've got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do not be casual about this stuff. Now, you may be saying, oh, no, he didn't mean blessed are the poor financially. No, no, no. He meant blessed are the poor in spirit because it says that in another place in Scripture, blessed are the poor in spirit. But that's not what it says here. It says blessed are the poor. And then it goes on to be a little bit more specific. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Hungry people, poor people are hungry, okay? Rich people aren't. (laughs) Those who weep now, blessed are those who weep, those who mourn, for they will be comforted, for they will laugh. You guys, you've poured out the same condemnation, some of you, not all of you, but some of you, without even, some of you, are, you know, do it with the best intentions and you don't even think about what you're doing. And that's what the Word of God has come to you today, to do, to convict your heart of truth, okay? I know that all of you that belong to the Lord, you're going to hear His voice. I'm confident of that. But you guys, if you have looked at somebody who has lost a child to cancer and you said, well, you know what? <sighs> If they would have had a revelation of faith, you know, then God would have healed them because my kids never get sick because I've got a revelation of faith. You know, I, I don't have any debt because I've got a revelation of faith and I'm a really good steward, you know. If they would just listen to me, I could teach them about faith, you know. But what can you do if people don't get it? They don't get it, right? You've just called those who mourn cursed. You're pretending that God shows you favoritism over them because you've got more faith than they do. First of all, God doesn't distinguish between those who have a lot of faith and those who don't when it comes to getting his will done. All he needs is a little mustard seed of faith. And if you think God cannot do something great and miraculous in somebody's life if they have doubt, um, hello, look at the disciples. That's why he picked those guys, because they were regular guys. (laughs) And what was he always saying to them? Oh, ye of great faith. (laughs) Is that why he chose them? Because of their great revelation of faith and because they never had any doubt? Man, if he couldn't do anything with somebody who had doubt, he would have never been able to do anything with the disciples because they doubted all the time. No, and what was he always saying to them? Oh, ye of little faith. Shaking his head. Was he able to use the disciples, guys? Was he able to do miracles in their life? Don't pretend that God's showing you favoritism because you've got a better brand of faith. And besides that, when you say that, you may not realize it, but you are flying in the face of the authority of God's word. Because God said, that, I mean, God's word says in James, he says, do you not know that I have chosen the poor of the earth to be rich in faith? But you insult the poor. Do you see what he just did there? He identified the poor saints of God. As the experts in faith, the ones who are rich in faith. Isn't that interesting that nowadays we go to teachers who are really filthy rich, who claim to be experts in faith. We go to them to learn about faith. And they claim that they're the ones that God has given the revelation to. They fly in the face of the authority of the word of God because God didn't say he chose the rich to be rich in faith. He said he chose the poor. Do those people have poor ministers who live Meal to meal, paycheck to paycheck, 
on their board, instructing them and giving them godly counsel and teaching them about faith? Oh, no. Who do they hang with? Well, the other people who, who got it. The other, the other ones that are blessed of God because they've got so much faith and they've got so much money. They don't respect the word of God. They don't, they don't respect those that God has set up as the experts. I want to say this to you if you are poor. <clears throat> Do not listen to anybody who challenges the word of God. They are not from God, you guys. They weren't sent to you from God. Now, you may have gotten some good things out of the word from these teachers, you guys. You know? Because the word of God is the word of God, and whether it is preached with good intentions or bad intentions, if it is the straight word, then it is going to minister to you. But see, Satan likes to, to mix his lies with truth, doesn't he? And you just need to know this. If you are poor, God does not condemn you because you are poor. And you guys, you know what? The definition of poor really is you can't quite make it in this world. You really don't have the resources or the ability or whatever the reason is to make your ends meet. To even just survive. That you either, ha- either have a hard time doing that or you're not being successful. You're not finding su- success in doing that. It means that you don't have enough money to pay your bills. Now, ooh, some people are getting mad now. Well, that's not godly. That's not godly to say that you wouldn't have enough money to pay your bills. That's not God's will. Those people aren't blessed of God. They're cursed of God. No, no, no. You have got to learn. If it doesn't make sense to your intellect, well, guess what? You're getting closer because the Bible says that the word of God frustrates the intelligence of the intelligent and that he chooses the foolish things. You know, the things that we think are stupid and foolish and weak. Shame the wise of the world and the strong things of the world. So if it's frustrating you, it, you know, don't be surprised. That's what the Word of God does, and you've got a choice. When you can't understand how God could say that somebody's blessed when they can't pay their insurance, how could God define someone that way? That doesn't make sense to me. Well, you know what? He just did it, so you've got a choice. Are you going to agree with him, or are you going to make up your own doctrine? What are you going to do? And, you know, you're asking the wrong question. You're saying, are they blessed? <laughs> Or are they cursed? And you're judging them to be cursed and you to be blessed. When God didn't just tell you to be blessed, but he said that you were to be a blessing. You know, he said that to Abraham. He, When God blessed Abraham, it wasn't just to bless Abraham. He said, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing to all the families of the earth. Are you a blessing to the poor person? See, you're asking the wrong question. God expects you to help the poor, not to judge them. He's already given his judgment of the poor. They're blessed. You don't like it? Too bad. He's God. Now, lest you think that this is just saying poor in spirit, he goes on to say, woe to you who are rich. Man, that's harsh. That can't possibly mean what it says. No way. God wouldn't have the audacity to say to the rich people of this earth, woe to you. Well, you know what? He's God. And you sure don't mind saying to the poor people, woe to you, you're cursed, you've got an evil spirit, when you're rich. Do you? That's not horrendous to you that you would think that about another person. But when it's switched around, and see, that's what God does. He comes to overthrow the kingdom of mammon, not to make another version of it or to make it a little bit better. He came to overthrow Satan's kingdom. And establish his father's kingdom, which is a completely different economy. It does not resemble Satan's kingdom. And it turns everything on its head for us. Because what we valued, he doesn't value. And what we thought was weak and despised, he chose those things and he exalted them. So what are you going to do? Are you going to agree? Or are you going to disagree? Now, there are a lot of questions that come with this. If you are rich, you know, there are a lot of questions that come with this. But the very first thing that you've got to establish before you even go to those other questions of how do I apply the word of God to my life so that I don't have a curse on me because of the fact that I have a lot of money. Before you get to the practical application, you've got to determine that you're going to let the word have the authority. First, you've got to determine that you are going to accept God's definitions of what is blessed and what is cursed, whether it makes sense to you or not. You can't go any further until you get there because... Until you make that decision. 
because until you make that decision that you're going to take God's word for what it means, no matter how hard it is, and no matter what he requires of you, until you get to that place, then everything, when it comes to the, the practical application of the word, you're gonna, your, your deceptive heart is going to twist it around. Because, you see, you found a way to call what is evil good and what is good evil. Now, we're, you know, we can't go into everything that I'd love to go into today. But I want to I read a scripture to you to help you understand why God defines these things this way. I'm going to read you a scripture um, about the rich young ruler. You guys have heard it. Mark 10, 17 through 31 says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed, and they said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So you guys, we see here that that Jesus loves the rich. Okay? Jesus did not say woe to the rich because he wants you to go to hell or because he hates you. Well, he said it to warn you. Because he wants you to heed that warning. He wants so badly for you to follow him and become his disciple. When he looked at this young man, you guys, this was personal. This was not just a generic call for disciples. This was a young man that he looked at him face to face and he loved him. And he reached out to him and he offered him the invitation to come and be his disciple. And he told him what the cost was. It was everything. And, and, and the guy went away sad. Why? Because in, in, the, in the young man's estimation, it was too high a price to pay to be in an intimate discipleship relationship with Jesus Christ. And see, Jesus knows that our hearts are evil, you guys. And it doesn't matter who of us. I mean, if we're poor and we've got a, a bunch of money poured upon us, we're all going to have the same reactions. Our flesh have, has the same reaction to money every time. It makes us proud, and it makes us want to hold on even tighter. We're not going to let go of that advantage, because in this world, the advantage of money and power and glory, it is so hard to get. It is so exclusive. It is such an exclusive club that we would never dream of giving up that advantage, uh, that advantage once we get it. And that is exactly why God requires it of us. It's not because God is stingy and mean and he doesn't want you to have any comfort or luxury or anything like that. He's going to give you all that stuff, you guys. Just have a little patience. All right? It's stored up for you in the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to be here that long. Come on. You're only here for a few minutes. Can we not... Can we not suffer with Christ for just a few minutes in comparison with eternity? No, it's not that he doesn't want us to have good things. It's that he requires our heart. And that is the crux of the matter, you guys. He knows that when we have riches, we trust in them. And we say we trust in God, but we trust in our riches. And the only way to test it is for us to give them up. You see, the one thing that you won't give up, that is the one thing that God requires. Why? Because he wants your heart. And the one thing that you say God is not allowed to touch, that's your idol. And you know, as Christians, we don't say he's not allowed to touch it. We just say, oh, that's not God's will. It's not God's will for me to actually sell everything and give it to the poor. He said it. Why? You don't want to be a disciple? You don't want to take the invitation? You, you want to say that this rich young ruler, he's the exception to the rule, and, and God doesn't require that of everybody? What you're saying is you don't, want, you don't want to take the invitation either. 
And you guys, Jesus, Jesus told another story about a woman. He, it says that he was in the temple, and I'm not going to read it. You guys can go read it yourself. It is in um, Mark 12:38 through 44, but I'm just going to tell you the story. He was in the temple with his disciples, and he was looking at all the Pharisees, and they were coming in, and a lot of wealthy people, and they were throwing large sums of money into the bucket, you know. And then he watched this widow come up and give her last mite, her last bit of money, and throw it in there. And he said, this widow has given more than anybody else. Why? Because she gave her last bit. And so, you guys, the Bible, it, it, I mean, Jesus, he requires the same thing of everybody, whether you're rich or poor. He requires everything. Because he wants your heart. And he knows whatever it is that we want to hold on to, that's, that's the thing that we really love. It's only when we're, we're, we're willing to give it all and totally trust him to take care of our needs and not trust in our own abilities and not trust in our money, but trust in him and just follow him in obedience. That's what he wants. That's what he requires. That's why it says, to whom much has been given, much is required. Do you notice that the same amount is required that is given? (laughs) Whatever is given to you, it's going to be required of you. Because he wants to see that you're, you're willing to give everything. He wants your heart. Why? Because he wants to judge you? No, because he loves you. And that's why he's warning you. If you have money, don't fool yourself. Do not call what is evil good and what is good evil. Do not call poverty a curse. When God says it's a blessing, why is it a blessing? Why was that widow blessed? Was it because she was a better person? It was because she was in a place in life where she understood that what she had, it couldn't help her anyway. She could see that clearly. Because of the place that she was put in life. That's why it's a blessing for her to be there. Because it helps her to see clearly. She knew that that might wasn't going to help her. She could trust God. That's why God said he's chosen the poor to be rich in faith. It's easier for them to see. But Jesus says in Revelation, he says, he's talking to one of the churches and he says, you know, you say I am rich. (laughs) But really, you don't know it. But you're poor and you're wretched and you're blind and you're naked. I advise you, listen, you guys, I advise you, he said, to buy from me salve for your eyes that you may see. Riches blind you to the truth. Your deceptive heart will twist these words around to try to justify keeping what you really want. But if you want to keep Christ, you've got to shed everything else. You've got to cast it all out. You've got to cast it all off. The sin that so easily entangles, the cares of the world, all of that, and you've got to press forward and you've got to take hold of Christ. See, the cost for knowing Christ is everything, you guys. And we fool ourselves into thinking that God needs us to be rich in order to show his glory. That is not scriptural, you guys. I want to read you a scripture out of 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 8. It says this, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power from God is not from us. You see, you guys, when you fool yourself into thinking that God needs you to drive a nice car in order to show his glory so that the world will be attracted to him, they're not going to be attracted to God. They're going to be attracted to your car. You want to brag about the fact that you never mourn because your kids never get sick? God's a blessing to those who mourn because, you guys, it's only when your heart is broken that you really have intimacy with Christ when you share in his sufferings. It's a blessing And if you go through life coasting through without any problems, your heart never gets opened up, cracked open, busted on the floor like that alabaster box. It never happens. And the perfume that is God never has a chance to get out. It's a blessing, you guys, to go through hard things. And you know what? It's a lie. It is a lie from Satan that God needs to show his glory through the filthy lucre of this world. You guys, if you think that your Armani is worthy of Jesus Christ, you have not seen his glory. You have not even glimpsed his beauty. If you think that he needs the value added of your little trinkets and your little houses and your jewelry and your whatever, your wealth, you think that brings glory to God? The only people that that is going to attract 
are people who want God for his money and his power, the gold diggers, Babylon, the false church. The bride of Christ is attracted to Christ who is on the cross, bloodied and beaten, because that's where she sees the love, and that's where she goes. And she loves him so much that she says, you know what, I'm going to go there too. I'll do that too. She says, I love you, and you are beautiful to me. He is beautiful, bloodied on a cross. He doesn't need your Armani. See, this says that he has shown us the glory of God in the face of Christ. People don't see the glory of God in your money. They see your glory. And that's why it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. God doesn't dress us up to show his power. He weakens us and makes us plain and makes us nothing. And he chooses the things that are weak and despised so that people can see, hey, that miraculous, beautiful thing coming out of that person, it didn't come from them because they're nothing. That glory coming out of them, wow, that didn't come from them. They're poor. <laughs> See, that's when people can see the glory of God. But when we're all dressed up in the filthy lucre of this world, all they can see is the world. They can't see God's glory. And don't you dare, don't you dare even compare mammon with the glory of God. It doesn't even begin to compare with the all-surpassing glory of God in the face, the beautiful face of Jesus Christ. So you guys, I would encourage you. We're going to do some more teaching on, on what Jesus has to say about money and all that kind of stuff and the practical applications of this. But I just wanted to introduce you to this today to really check your hearts and say, have I been calling the people cursed that God calls blessed? Have I been wanting to get into a position of wealth when it's just going to make it hard for me to enter the kingdom of heaven? Just look really carefully at what you set your heart on, okay, you guys? Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, because wherever your treasure is, there is your heart. If you store up money for yourself here, you guys, you're going to be invested here. That's what Jesus said. That's where your eyes are going to be, and your whole body will be full of darkness, because your focus will be on the things of the world. It's not that hard to understand, okay? So I just encourage you guys to get along with God. Examine your heart by the word of God. And ask the Lord, like, what he, do what he advised you to do. Because, you guys, it's not just the rich that have this problem, because really, we all want to be rich. <laughs> it's our desire that is the problem, okay? But let's do what Jesus advised us to do. Let us ask him to give us salve for our eyes that we may see, and fine linen to dress ourselves in, so that our nakedness will not be seen. So we will not be ashamed on the day of the Lord. God bless you guys, and I love you, and I'll see you again next week. Yeah.